from what he said, or to his timing. Anyway, let me introduce our guest, uh, uh, Professor Xuanin Liang. I guess for people working on remote sensing, probably no need to, to uh, introduce him. He has been really highly regarded in the remote sensing community, has been working on a variety of remote sensing topics, uh, wrote a few books, and also hundreds of uh, 300 papers on the remote sensing, primarily on the terrestrial stuff and some aspects as well, such as radiation budget, uh, land cover, land uh, defense index, uh, radiation budget, etc. So he has been uh, really active in, in a wide range of topics and would like to hear uh, his talk about uh, uh, remote sensing products generated over the uh, last few years on the global scale, which might be very useful to many of your studies. Okay, with no further delay. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, good afternoon, thank you for coming. Um, thank uh, Zhang Qing for his kind uh, invitation. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it's great pleasure to be here. Does it work? Okay, good, yeah. And also I'd like to thank Zhang for making all these uh, logistic arrangements. Um, maybe my uh, fault, yeah, some of the animation and the slides may shut off, um, but I should probably just give you some general ideas. What do we do? What do we have done? And what do we have so that you, we can have more <coughs> interactions later? Um, this is a team effort. So many people contributed to this project. So I'm not going to um, name them individually. This is an um, outline. Yeah, I will begin with some general background and then the uh, overview of these uh, glass products and yeah, try to demonstrate the values of those products by showing some uh, examples. And also I would like to uh, briefly introduce some ongoing activities that will produce more products. Um, okay, this ge general background, our Earth system is changing and uh, to monitor those changes, yeah, satellite remote sensing certainly is, is uh, um, the essential uh, tool and I list uh, a series of satellite missions that relate to land service monitoring, uh, from uh, particularly from 1972. Uh, I circulated several ones. Uh, 72, the first land satellite one. Uh, 81, the first uh, NOAA seven data that ha have widely used for uh, monitoring land service properties. And then, of course, it is uh, uh, 1999, the uh, Terra launch, the beginning of the U.S. program. And then after 2000, uh, are more uh, satellite missions. Here I want to particularly mention the uh, US. This is a very significant, in my perspective, at least from two parts. The first part is, is the first mission uh, comprehensively monitoring Earth system. And the second one is the first time to convert the uh, satellite observation to high level products. The data center providing not, not only the original data, <coughs> but also the uh, physical variables. And so this presentation actually is related to um, the high level product. Um, converting these law observations to uh, physical variables uh, requires a serious process yeah, from its uh, calibration, uh, atmosphere correction, and so on. So it requires expertise and also the essential facility to handle a huge amount of data. That's part of the reasons right now the data centers are produce, generating those products rather than individual people working on the um, conversion. And this is what we um, have done in the past few years uh, for generating the glass products. So this is the general background. And we Created uh, a glass production system. Yeah, right now the data storage has about uh, over three terabytes. So a lot of data yeah, online, um, about 800 terabytes. And it's high performance computing. And so far we have released 12 products, um, mostly related to um, ecosystem, uh, like deep area index. Um, Brushing of vegetation uh, cover and so on. And also the, the service radiation budget components like albedo, temperature, um, emissivity, uh, incoming solar radiation, and so on. So uh, we, we are producing uh, more products, but those products are 
officially released and available to the public now. Yeah, it is, uh, um, well, that's the limitation of these resources. Yeah, we are generating the long time series for many products, eventually all these products, but uh, uh, it is a different phases. The first phase, we have long, um, some products uh, over 35 years, from 81 to uh, 2017, actually it's updating now. And some products are delayed a little bit, and we are still continuing. And yeah, I'm going to show you later at the last part of his presentation. Um, those products will be long time time series. Uh, yeah, this presentation probably I will not give you uh, too much details. Yeah, the, but I do have the uh, uh, detailed information, the papers, and, and so on, and uh, uh, that will provide more details. Uh, most of them we are using uh, FHI and MODIS. Those are the two uh, major sensors, uh, satellite data we are using. Yeah. Right now we are also trying to incorporate more satellite uh, data uh, in order to improve the quantity and its uh, accuracy. Um, now, given all these uh, products generated by NASA, by NOAA here, and also by ESA, for example, and why, why do we need to generate another suite of products, the glass? Why do you want to use in those products? Well, here, I give you some reasons. And the glass products have some unique features. Uh, first of all, it's based on a solid a theoretical uh, foundation. And, uh, uh, the algorithm uh, publishing the top remote sensing journals. And uh, um, so right now everybody can produce products, but it could be garbage if you don't have a good theoretical understanding and solid uh, algorithm. And then you have some other features. Uh, we already mentioned uh, many products have a long temporal coverage over 35 years. That's suitable for uh, long-term environmental changes. And then some products, particularly the radiation products, have high special resolution, so five kilometers versus one degree, for example, right now are widely available. And then we also generated the first high resolution, the special, both special and temporal, uh, broadband emissivity product. And then, of course, we try to uh, demonstrate uh, those products are highly accurate and, and consistent. And if you notice that we have publishing, uh, for each product, we're publishing a lot of papers, actually. And uh, we are uh, focused uh, on different aspects uh, of remote sensing motion algorithm, uh, like using uh, prior knowledge or using algorithm integration or using multiple data sources and so on. And, and then, as uh, Zhen Qing mentioned, uh, we are also working on these books and try to well, that's demonstrating uh, we are at least a frontier of the remote sensing uh, in motion. And so that gives you some confidence. This team uh, has a good uh, foundation. Uh, well, looks like it's working. Huh? And since we are generating the time, long time um, temporal coverage, <coughs> and so it, obviously we can capture the, the dynamics of land service purposes. Uh, here I just want to go through very quickly. Uh, land surface are beautiful, for example, as an example. If you look at it, the uh, uh, modis uh, views there uh, starting from 2000 or even 2013, and then bunch of uh, um, products from ESA, and, but they also show a period of time. And uh, uh, since we are using FHR, yeah, so the, we can cover uh, more than 35 years. And the AOEI product, this is uh, another, uh, that's kind of a, a flagship uh, product of a glass uh, product suite. And you can see there's a tremendous amount of uh, dynamics on the land service. And then it's, uh, um, this is a fraction of vegetation cover. And we compute, this is a time, long time series. So we also compute the, uh, um, the GeoLand uh, FBC. 
that probably is the best product from Europe. Yeah, Modis doesn't have a, a fraction of education cover. And so we demonstrated in the paper, yeah, we have much better special coverage and no data gaps and data quality. Uh, it's, uh, it's very good, yeah, even better accuracy. This is the FA power product, yeah, and it's similar to AOEI. You can see the, the tremendous amount of uh, variation. Um, and then is the web transpiration. I want to mention that that is based on the algorithm integration. Right now, if you look at it, the mode is uh, the NASA's algorithm or ESAS. Uh, most, most of the products generally are based on one product, one algorithm. And here we try to create the product based on the integration of five algorithms, so including the modus algorithm. And in theory, if we just doing everything similarly, um, we can achieve at least the same accuracy as uh, as the modus product. Yeah. Actually, in the paper we demonstrated uh, using algorithm integration, we can take advantage of the, the strengths of of individual algorithms so that the final product. It's, it's more accurate and has better uh, quantity. So here I want to demonstrate why do we need a long time series product. And this is the example of uh, Greenland. You know, we all know because of the global warming and a lot of snow melting occur in the uh, Greenland. Uh, this is the modus imaging in the July and the white part pretty much still snow ice covered but the rest of the island uh, pretty much melt. And so when we look at the albedo, we can show the, the difference here. On top of the Greenland, uh, albedo changes uh, little. But if you look at the edge, particularly low elevation, a lot of albedo decrease, we can see. Um, particularly if we look at the average albedo will be the past 30 years, we can see the, the, um, the tremendous variations here at the first Decade, the recent decade, albedo decreased dramatically. That means the snow melting did not happen too often in the first few a couple of decades yeah, until recently. If we are using modus albedo to detect the trend, this is the trend we will get, and this is the trend actual albedo is. So that demonstrated the importance of long time satellite products for detecting. Um, the Earth surface changes. And this is another example of um, the global orbital changing at the global scale in the past 30 years, uh, over 30 years. So it's very interesting. In the winter, orbital increase uh, global scale. And then in the summer, uh, orbital decrease. And then the major driver actually is the changes in snow cover. So we put the two lines here. Where is the global orbital? Another line is the snow uh, snow cover. So the two lines have very good correlations, either decrease or increase in the summer and the, and the winter. And the, uh, the emissivity I mentioned, it's, uh, um, notice it has the spectral uh, uh, spectral emissivity product. And uh, uh, many people have developed these uh, emissivity maps in order to drive these uh, global models. And here we are generating these uh, um, Eight day, five kilometer, uh, uh, one kilometer emissivity after 2000, before 2000, it's a five kilometer a global emissivity product. And if you look at it, the global circulation models, many of them using simple, uh, simple formulation of the emissivity or using the, the map, emissivity map. So here you can see the, the tremendous amount of variation because of its uh, seasonal changes. The snow cover changing to vegetation and soil and so on. And years ago, well, almost 10 years ago, we published a paper in Journal of Climate demonstrating the importance of satellite emissivity. And we run it a uh, couple models, so the atmosphere model and the land surface model. And we keep everything the same except the um, surface emiss emissivity. This is a morning genius work. And she, um, Running the model using default values and then changing the, changing the emissivity by satellite emissivity product. And then that's the difference. And we look at the multiple product, uh, variables. That's just uh, year 
air temperature. So this is the mean temperature, the global distribution, and then see the difference between the model simulation between the default emissivity value and the satellite emissivity value. So it, as you can see, the difference as large as two degrees, it's a huge. Um, so that illustrates the importance of satellite products. And the radiation products I mentioned, yeah, if you look at it, the series product or GOX, uh, ISCCP, there are special resolutions quite close. One degree or 100 kilometer or 200, 280 kilometers. And for atmosphere study, for climate study, that's probably okay. But for lay applications, we need much higher special resolution. So we are generating five kilometer product. And well, this paper doesn't show up. The, if you look at it, the WMO requirements, it requires a much higher special resolution from one kilometer, 20 kilometer, or 100 kilometer. So the, the uh, then, um, I also, uh, we also look at it, uh, uh, this is the two, two maps. So where is the series map? If you look at it, the series radiation product, this is the surface near radiation. You can see the boxes one by one because it's a one degree by one degree. And then, if you look at the glass uh, near radiation product, this is the world of Beijing uh, around, around the surrounding area. And it has tremendous amount of details. So it really depends on applications. Um, okay, um, this also <laughs> uh, doesn't shut up. And a few months ago, we published an article in the JGR. And we look at it, we validated the series product, the nail radiation product, and the glass nail radiation product. If you look at the scatter plot, they're both pretty similar. But if we average it with a, um, and it's a global land surface area, and then look at the trend. It's very interesting. The series uh, gave us an uh, increasing trend from 2002 to 2008. That means the near radiation, the available energy will be the land surface increasing the last the first 10 years. But we, when we look at it, the glass uh, product is decreasing. That means the energy will be land surface uh, Decreasing in the, in the first uh, about 10 years. And so it's a totally different upset trend. And then we also look at the several reanalysis products which are consistent with the glass product. So that demonstrates the, um, the different, well, that actually the, emphasizes the importance of uh, validation. That needs to look at the temporal variation uh, rather than just scatter plot. And because when you have large uncertainty, that probably will capture, uh, miss, miss uh, capture of the, uh, the trends. Um, um, that's, it. <laughs> that's it another work. We try to demonstrate what's the big deal if we have much better um, radiation product. And we illustrated here in this uh, paper. The same GPP model, and yeah, we only change the input of solar radiation. So we input it uh, six, I, I think. Uh, one of them is a glass uh, product, and then we demonstrated the glass product uh, general, uh, produces the best uh, uh, GPP uh, simulation uh, based on the ground validation. The AIAI product, as I mentioned, this is a flagship of a glass product switch. Yeah, it has over uh, 35 years. Uh, it's a long time series. And we, um, yeah, I apologize. The, um, last year, we published an article in the, the, in the uh, Agricultural Forest Meteorology. And we compare a four long time uh, AIAI products available in the, in the uh, global community. And we find out that the glass uh, EOEI product has, uh, has the best uh, accuracy, yeah, yeah. no gaps. Yeah. This is a special and a temporal continuous. Yeah. yeah, if you're interested, you can check the paper. I list the, the, uh, the information. The full information of the paper is available now. Um, then we also, um, a couple of months ago, the another a paper published in the remote sensing environment by another group. It's an independent uh, validation, uh, including uh, Ranga Minani, the modest EOEI product developer. 
And that paper showed glass uh, EOEI product has its uh, least uh, acidity. That means it's the best accuracy. Um, OK, at least the, the, the conclusion is clear. And the glass product has the lowest uncertainty uh, by computing um, nowadays uh, 0v1. This is the best, probably best European uh, EAI product. Um, here I just quickly showed you several examples uh, using a EAI product in the old system modeling, for example. And if you look at the EAI values in, in those global models, they are giving a very long EOEI value. And so that emphasizes the importance of satellite product for improving the global modeling. And this is the example using glass EOEI for driving the VIC model. This is a famous hydrological model. Many of you know quite well. And this is another example using glass EOEI for detecting the greening trend over China. This is a big topic right now. And uh, um, in other paper, in the nature of uh, climate changing, they show the uh, greening trend, not just over China. Actually, it's a global phenomenon. So they're also using uh, glass EOEI product to, uh, to detect the greening trend. OK, and the same thing for the, the FAA part. And we also published in the article in the IEEE TGAS uh, last year, demonstrating uh, the glass FAFR product has better uh, quality and uh, a higher accuracy compared to other two long time series uh, FAFR products. Uh, okay, the, that figure shut up. Okay, so, so if you look at it, uh, uh, the chance is the temporal variation, no, no missing data, no gaps, and uh, accuracy also is better. So okay, if I convince you those products are good, and then still tell you some information how to get those data, and you can get uh, information from the GIS portal. And so those essentially will lead you to the uh, to the, the actual data. So that's just an example. If you search service relation, that will tell you what is the service relation product is about, and then where you can download it. The actual physical location of those products. Uh, there are two places. One is in China. Another one is in uh, a global lack of facility in University of Maryland. And this is quite a famous one uh, created by John Thompson. And OK, that was the general overview uh, of God's product. And, uh, um, and then I would like to show you uh, some examples, um, mostly done by my graduate students. Um, on using those uh, products. Uh, so we have done uh, quite a bit uh, for detecting and monitoring and for driving these uh, different models and even doing these uh, data simulation using ecological model or, or agricultural uh, plant growth model for estimating crop yield and so on. And so here are just some uh, quick um, examples. Uh, the water cycle changes in North China. Uh, as you probably know, it, it's, this is the uh, area, semi arid region in China, and uh, because of global changing, it's uh, drying, uh, it's drier and drier. And so we try to understand these, uh, um, the different components of the uh, water, uh, water cycle. And uh, uh, we look at the uh, precipitation, look at the uh, evapotranspiration. And, uh, uh, and so on. So try to understand the, uh, the trends and the variations, special temporal variations. Uh, we're using glass uh, ET product and also several other products. And then we also try to understand what caused that changing. And as you know, China spends billions, billions of dollars on ecological restoration over the north, uh, north, uh, northern China because it's uh, uh, land degradation and, uh, and other environmental uh, problems. And uh, uh, for the water cycle, uh, we, run it, uh, um, we run it the model. And then we find out um, actually the uh, major driver was not in the land uh, human activities, like ecological restor uh, restoration projects. 
yeah, mostly due to these uh, climate change, particularly precipitation. So these, uh, um, so that was the general conclusion. And then in other work uh, we did, uh, also with Northeast China, uh, this is a, a major uh, forest distribution area in China, and but it also a lot of uh, forest disturbance occurring there. So we try to look at it, uh, um, the forest disturbance and particularly look at the changing in biomass. And so we look at the biomass in the, the only 10 years, in the short period, and, but the idea is to, to have a much longer period. And then try to understand what causes the, uh, the dynamics, and then the, the, what is the uh, impact uh, by calculating the uh, relative forcing. Uh, so this is the biomass estimated from the glass and the, uh, and the mold data. And this is the mean, uh, the average in biomass distribution of Northeast China. And then we also uh, try to identify the, the drivers, uh, what causing these uh, uh, changes in biomass. And then as you can see, these, uh, we look at these uh, multiple uh, disturbing factors, the logging, uh, afforestation, reforestation, uh, the, the uh, forest fires, and then also look at these uh, uh, temperature, uh, precipitation, and so on. And then finally, we calculated the relative forcing uh, by ca mostly on the uh, changing in albedo. This is by fiscal effect, and we also look at the uh, CO2 uh, effect uh, since we come out with the biomass. And then we compute the, um, we look at the four uh, disturbing factors, as I mentioned, the logging, uh, fires, uh, insect damaging and uh, forestation. And so you can see in some cases that the uh, relative forcing due to albedo changes are uh, significant and some cases are smaller. And so that just demonstrated the imp uh, value of uh, glass albedo product. Another example is the uh, um, changing snow cover over North America, uh, North Hemisphere. And that's is that uh, we pay attention to this phenology. So we pay attention to this day the first snowfall, and I also look at it the day, uh, the last snow cover. So the difference gives us the uh, period of snow cover. And so we look at it the three values, and at it the North Hemisphere. And quite interesting, uh, we can see the contrast between the high latitude and the low latitude, uh, middle latitude. So if you look at it, the average, in the, this is the starting day of the snow cover. So in the high latitude, it starts later, the middle latitude start earlier. This is the snow, uh, the last day of the snow cover. So in the high latitude, the snow finishing uh, disappeared earlier. And then middle latitude here uh, lasts longer. So if you look at it, the total length of the snow cover in the middle latitude here, actually is longer. The high latitude here, actually is shorter. So that is a very interesting uh, contrast of the phenology. And then we also try to quantify the relative forcing because the snow has a much higher albedo. That's the cooling effect. If the snow melts and the albedo becomes much smaller, and then it's a, uh, it is a relative uh, warming effect. So we look at it, uh, um, that's the uh, uh, latitude distribution. So the high latitude is it's a warming, and the middle latitude is a cooling effect. And then if we average it together, uh, this is, uh, uh, yeah, we have the glass albedo product. We're also using the, the same model output, uh, the kernel approach to calculate the radiation uh, changes at the top of the atmosphere. And then that was the, uh, only a decade. And we look at it uh, a much longer time series. Uh, three decades, with China specifically, and then it's a similar trend, the snow cover distribution here, the most in the uh, north, uh, northwest, and this is Xinjiang, and then uh, northeastern here, China. And uh, uh, if you look at it, the changes, uh, those two regions, this is the Tibetan plateau, this is northeast, they have an uh, increase in uh, snow cover. And uh, uh, so if you look at it, the averaging at the national scale, the China has its uh, increase in snow cover in the past three decades. Um, then if you look at the individual months, they have a different uh, variation. 
And then we calculated the relative forcing. Um, the, the changing uh, radiation at the top of the atmosphere is kind of uh, um, understandable. It's uh, more uh, much stronger relative forcing, the cooling effect in those regions. And then if you look at the trend, the relative forcing, the cooling effect is enhanced in the field, uh, particularly in the, uh, the last uh, decade or so. And okay, um, that was the, uh, um, the snow cover. Yeah, another thing I think is quite interesting uh, is the uh, Three Gorges Dam. That is the largest dam in China, probably many, many of you have heard. And after creating this dam, and there is a big reservoir before the dam. So there's obviously land cover changing, uh, land cover changing from the uh, grasslands, forest, and to the, the water. So we try to understand uh, these uh, uh, temperature changing, the, uh, resulting this big uh, reservoir. Uh, okay, it didn't shut up. Uh, yeah, I apologize. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, we look at its uh, um, albedo effect. We also look at its evapotranspiration effect. And then we find out the, um, the impact land surface temperature are quite, quite minimal in the winter. But in the summer, it has significant cooling effect. But in the cooling effect, mostly in the uh, uh, five kilometer buffer along the uh, reservoir. And Many people are wondering the impact of the big reservoir, the three gorgeous dam. And uh, I spent the summer in Wuhan, and then when I talked to the taxi, the taxi driver will tell you, Wuhan used to be very hot. Right now, it's much milder because of the three gorgeous, uh, three gorgeous dam. So probably it's not true, but it's, uh, uh, so we try to understand if this is actually caused by the dam. And my, our conclusion is, Probably not. Uh, we try to also look at the precipitation, but that gave us the confusing message. So at the end, we only publish in the, the, the temperature part. Um, oh boy, this one. Um, that we also, um, this <laughs> we also look at, that's is the, uh, the paper published a couple of months ago in these uh, uh, environmental research letters. And we look at these uh, land cover changes uh, over China uh, in the past uh, few decades. Um, then look at the land surface changes resulting uh, from the land cover changes. So of, of course, many of you probably are using a model to simulate the impact. And here we using the actual data and that is the uh, um, land cover map changes uh, made by China. They're using tens of laser data, yeah, a 30 meter resolution. And they're aggregated to one kilometer and release that product to the public. So we're using that product and also using the glass uh, ET and the glass arbiter to, uh, to make it the correlation between the changes in land cover from one type to another, like forest, to a cropland, to urban, and then also look at the albedo changing. Uh, by doing that, we also extracting the, the, um, the background climate changing. And so that we can come out with the, um, the quantified numbers uh, for certain land cover transaction, land cover changing, uh, which is the temperature changing. Uh, yeah, I apologize if all these figures um, don't show up. Well, a little bit here, that's one. Uh, here, to give you some example, for example. Um, this represents the intensity, the transition intensity. This one, for example, this is a uh, uh, cropland to urban. So if you look at it, uh, um, if the transition is smaller, uh, less than 20%, not much temperature changing. But if the uh, change is more than 40%, yeah, there will be a warming effect, so, something like that. So um, we look at it, uh, um, the daytime and nighttime land surface temperature. We look at the uh, albedo effect, look at the evapotranspiration effect, and try to quantify the impacts of each um, of those two facts for each uh, land cover conversion. Um, 
Okay, that was pretty much several examples, uh, mostly done by my graduate students, so very quickly. And still, I want to uh, show you very quickly about a couple of other activities are doing. The first one is um, the glass products right now is a one kilometer or five kilometer resolution, the global scale. And for climate changing, for many applications, that probably is the good resolution, or even probably too, the special resolution too high. And right now we are, for other layer applications, we need much higher special resolution. So um, we are developing high glass products. Uh, so that is uh, something uh, going on. We have not been able to uh, release these products yet. And let's just show you the example. We are have we have publishing this uh, algorithm on Arbido, and this is uh, on this is a broadband emissivity. This is also the Landsat. This is a uh, um, brushing of vegetation cover from Landsat. Um, this is uh, um, the ET also from Landsat. So the algorithm are pretty much ready, and then we also set up is a uh, uh, facility to uh, to generate this tens of data. We're talking about several petabytes data, so um, involves a lot of processing. Another is is uh, uh, more CDR products. Uh, this is a big project involving uh, multiple institutes in China, and a lot of people involved. And general idea is to uh, generate more than 12 products. I just showed you. And yeah, actually, we, we are going to generating a 29 uh, climate data records. Um, and they also are working on these uh, algorithms for another 30 products. And those uh, products in five categories, uh, energy balance, ocean, environment, and so on. So essentially, not just land. We, we will have, those products will be in the atmosphere, ocean, and the land service. The yellow part are the, the CDR, the long time series products that will be generated. And then other products, mostly only the algorithm development. And so there, there won't be these uh, um, long time series, but only several, um, what generally is the product, uh, several years. Okay, uh, here just one example is the top of the atmosphere albedo. And this is something we, um, if you look at it, uh, well, it's, it's the biggest uh, doesn't shut up. And if you look at it, normally when you look at it, the top of the atmosphere uh, albedo, and we estimated, we estimated them from the uh, broadband albedo. Even John Chin studied them uh, many years ago. And their problem, particularly when you look at it, uh, high, high quantity data, that probably won't be available until 2000, the series uh, census. And we are developing approaches for estimating uh, top of the atmosphere energy balance uh, using high resolution, uh, particularly the narrow band uh, satellite data. And so we we have oh, it's the papers. Okay. So um, anyway, that's just a way example uh, from the uh, Maldives data, and this is a series uh, TOA Arbido product over North America, and this is uh, uh, estimate from Maldives. You can see there's a good uh, special pattern matching, but uh, uh, Maldives pro provides much better uh, details. Uh, so it really depends on applications. Um, and then we also estimate uh, albedo, TOA albedo from uh, AVHR data, so that we can generate in the um, 30 years or 35 years time series. So here we compare with the series data, the two products pretty much match together. If you look at the difference, it's around it's, uh, 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 it's below than 3% or, or even smaller. And then the AVHR can extend it much longer. So that's the general idea. Anyway, this is a quick conclusion. Um, the glass products have some unique features, as I say. It really depends on your applications. And then, um, and also, I showed you several examples demonstrating the values of these uh, glass um, products. And that's all I have. Yeah, thank you. Apologize again for all the uh, animation stuff and figures. <laughs> K 
Can you talk a little bit about how you dealt with calibration differences between the um, between the satellites over such a long time period? Like AVHRR goes back to 1981, and there are different calibrations um, compared to MODIS. How how did you deal with that? That that is a very good question. Yeah, this, uh, uh, right now, at the very beginning, we our idea was to uh, create a product before. Uh, 2000 using AVHR, and then uh, after 2000 using MODIS, and then we find out it didn't work. The reason is that the calibration, yeah, so we can see the, the jump around 2000. That also is uh, because of the big El Nino in um, 90, 97, 98, and then there's a lot of uh, land surface also changing around that time. So it's difficult to tell. It's the difference is the jump, big jump due to the satellite calibration or due to the uh, natural uh, phenomena. So right now, we are generating the two products. One, completely from AVHR. So right now, from 81 to now. And then also, we generated the uh, mobile product. And, and then, actually, we, are, uh, we can see some difference. We are spending a lot of time right now trying to uh, harmonize those two products and make sure they are consistent. And, we are not doing any uh, calibration ourselves, and we rely on the uh, raw data set. And before we using a uh, long-term data record, pretty much generated by El Grupo Mon, the NASA group. And right now, we are also using uh, NOAA CDR. I think it's generated by uh, NASA Learning. That is another AVHR data set. Um, the, the NASA, the Eric uh, Vermont, they're generating the product only one value each day. But the learning product, they keep all these uh, uh, AVHR data sets so that in the high latitude region, you have multiple observations. Uh, um, they are also using different calibration kind of strategies. So at least we can look at it, uh, um, the impact of uh, different calibration kind of strategies. And I do have students right now working on the details of those calibration kind of issues. Also include some kind of uncertainty estimate. I mean, different calibration and many other things to be combined. Do you have estimates of that? That's a very good question. And uh, <clears throat> right now, there's a tendency right now, and uh, people produce the mean value, but also try to provide the uncertainty. But few few products are doing that operationally. So at least uh, we are generating the data quality. So that is the best estimated value. Those pixels are the uh, often low quality, uh, things like that. Yeah, but we do try to generate in those sensitivity. It's very hard, and uh, since it involves multiple steps, we don't know which step, what kind of uncertainty. Even some qualitative uh, estimates in terms of high low. Yeah, right now each product has the data quantity layer. Some quality is yes. Very useful for yes. Idea of which one of those data. Yeah, particularly is, uh, uh, those based on the optical data. Optical data heavily contaminated by cloud. Yeah, so on those regions with uh, cloud contamination, we kind of uh, special template of building those values. So in the data layer, uh, it has a good indication um, if this value actually retrieved or uh, built from the special temple of field or, or something like that. Products uh, from AVHR and uh, MODIS, you know, their channels are so much different. I mean, particularly when you do uh, cloud classification, um, several products will need uh, to use more channels. So when you compare this, uh, the channel difference will probably make a big difference still, right? Yeah, that's the, that's the, uh, that's the issue with the AVHR data. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, most of the products we only can rely on the first two channels, the red and the near infrared. Right. And uh, um, but we we also notice that if you uh, before people tend to using the linear relationship, and if we are using higher high degree like a second order polynomial function, we can account for some of the limit. Will come with the limitation of field uh, uh, bands. And also we try to using uh, the other channels, even the thermal channels. 
for this uh, for this visible part. That can provide some information about cloud, about the service purposes. So um, yeah, this uh, we just uh, use whatever we can we can get. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So not much uh, satellite data available before 2000. So right. this is a problem. Okay. Yeah, this is a very good po uh, point. Yeah, good comment. And uh, actually, I don't have many students. Yeah, uh, but uh, but if there are, there are resources, yeah, then mm -hmm. we can hire graduate students. And uh, uh, that is a very good point. And uh, uh, we need to demonstrate the uh, applications of those satellite products. So one point is. You also mentioned it, the satellite products getting better and better. And uh, particularly for anyone who is generating long time satellite, global satellite products, we focus on the, the consistency, and not just the uh, temporal consistency. We also look at the spatial consistency because these are different land cover, different atmosphere conditions. And uh, if you look at the literature, um, somehow I feel that the European community are producing more papers on integrating the models with satellite products, maybe because of the funding there. And here is the fewer papers coming from the US side. And so I think less area we shall we shall um, we we shall promote and facilitate. And uh, yeah it's uh, that's is a good example that the NOAA and the university can work together. And so. I guess uh, <laughs> my, my guess the reason is because the the signal from your improved uh, albedo product is, is much less than the noise produced by the weather forecasting. <laughs> so you probably won't see the any difference uh, if the weather model itself has much larger error. Yes. Yeah, it's not sensitive. It's just because the model, the, the numerical weather model, is much more airless than the than the surface albedo. I, I think that's most likely the reason. If you make a, you know, you know, albedo from you know four percent to five percent, the model error is twenty to thirty percent. So I, you know, I think that's probably the reason. Yeah. The cloud is much more error than the surface albedo. Yeah. 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 Want the next one? Yeah. Maybe I would just <laughs> like to add one more question. That uh, okay, I think we have uh, some satellite data producer here in this room, and uh, in our data development, uh, we sometimes just concern consider about how we can add some additional information into the satellite data, such as a quality flag that we we all know about that. Um, but in addition that uh, um, 
the there might be some other thing as well, like uh, we probably call it the di diagnostic information. When we use the satellite data and find that the data data for some times or some events, it does not work well, or if we do the validation to the in situ data, it does not match well, and we try to find why is that. So I'm just wondering that uh, you know when you develop the satellite data, do you have any kind of consideration to uh, include some diagnostic information in your satellite data, and then you know in case that you can use those kind of information later on in the application or in the validation purpose? That, that is a very good point, yeah. And uh, um, we, we have not started too much work on that aspect. And, uh, um, but we do uh, notice some problems, and uh, uh, calibration is uh, one of them uh, you mentioned. And uh, um, also there are some other issues, like AVHR. If we just look at the AVHR, there are data gaps. There's no AVHR observation for, for several months. And uh, uh, we try to uh, make up using some post-processing tactic to, to, to make it a special terminal continuous. Uh, but yeah, this is a very good point. We need to uh, look at the more details on this. Uh, on this. No, actually, we we did not run the model. We using the actual data, oh. and the, the, uh, so the, the conclusion actually come from is the the impact is the uh, um, the five five kilometer buffer. If, if beyond that, we using data from much larger region, we find out no changes associated with the uh, reservoir, uh, except in the, the central part, the, the five kilometer. Yeah, yeah, the modern part, no, we did not do that. So. Okay, uh, looks like uh, we have a lot of interest, so maybe we can put a discuss after the talk. The same speaker, and also Jiang from Northern Catherine here. Thank you all, too. Thank you. Yeah.